an excerpt from the fourth Min Virtual Cities Atlas of Video Game, Cities by Game Urbanist Konstantinos Demopoulos, and artist Mario Kelly Koki. You have not died until you have visited Rubikov, the liveliest, most vibrant place throughout the Mesoamerican Hades, the town that never died, an extravagant, cheerful yet forlorn city where heartbroken lovers await their soulmates. And the ancient dead dance wildly through countless nights, through the covert, a city of long shadows, paper mechanical skeletons, bright lights, and unexpected force, where the biggest of the bone bands play the finest beatbox tunes, and where Chaz and Moriarty get married to Andy and Melodies. This is the great post-mortem melting pot, the town where lost souls are bound to be found. And hardened criminals can watch the occasional Saint Ambrose the Norda Mona cruises to us a restful afterlife. This high life port town of the land of the dead is located on the coast of the Sea of the Mind, and thus serves as a crucial way station on the far-year journey to the ninth underworld and eternal rest. Reaching it means braving the petrified forest, and then upon the rival. Buying passage across the ocean as quickly as possible, yet somehow this almost transient place keeps on growing. Souls tend to linger here in waiting, after losing hope in a better hereafter, are by being swept away by this breathtaking urbanistic embodiment of Mayan, Aztec, Toltec, and Mexican metaphysical beliefs. Root the comet, not being a theologically detailed location. Did not always exist, but is far older than anyone remembers. Its turbulent history has a palpable weight to it, as the dead refusing to leave the afterlife behind are always the more intriguing ones. And their city, teetering between a full-on mortal and a revolutionary hub, could never be anything but fascinating. The mood of Rubikov has definitely seen much as the tiny transit. Town by the sea great or become today's metropolis, and geographers have long argued whether nostalgia, a allure, is the main centrifugal force boosting its population. Sense of loss aside, though, this is an undeniably stunning, intoxicating city. The city laps mesmerizingly against lofty bridges. Sublime BAS relief decorations can be discovered in the most unexpected of places. The shadows of emphatic buildings hold countless secrets and drinking holes, and sudden explosions of scale and spectacle regularly impress. At in the blimps, sky traffic, the gargantuan cat racing truck, and unrivaled nightlife, eye-catching sky signs, the lively masses of the dead and a thousand promises, and the city's gravitational pull makes absolute sense. The sights are countless, the colors dizzying, the music perfect, the scope of inspiring, and the aesthetic experience of getting lost worth dying for. One path might lead to an abandoned lighthouse, another to a forgotten pier, and the third to a cliff carved elevator. Towards a whole section of town, complete with massive casino, Ruta Cave life is not confined to savoring spatial delights. Holding a job, are playing the kitties. Things often get exciting, dangerous, and even hopeless in this city of the poor, masquerading as the cosmopolitan town of the rich. Demonic bouncers abound, skeletal birds mock, and betrayal, passion, and passionate betrayal are as common as tensions and stark divisions, shattered illusions, shady schemes, the occasional miracle. An unashamedly corrupt police force and the popular desire for post-mortem justice make a unexplosive mix that only temporarily abates during the day of the dead, the single day of the year when shows, clubs, and slot machines stand abandoned, and when the overworked nurses are allowed a moment of respite, walking the streets on any other day reveals a staggering menagerie of characters. Posh lawyers, hip club owners, exhausted or defiant workers, gangsters, agents of the Department of Death, artists, 
Sailors on the campus roam the shadows of emblematic skyscrapers and gather around stepped pyramids on the vast plazas. Rarely, the occasional farmer florists researching the forensic site of botany can also be glimpsed. Second death by sprouting is a notoriously flowery and complex sphere. Apparently, one only florists can analyze. And only mob bosses can turn into macabre gardens. It is in the harbor district, though, in the oldest part of town, where the vibrancy of in life truly explodes. The gigantic feline meadows race track effortlessly dominates the area and sets the tone. Even if locals know that the old town can offer more than baths and transit, hidden in an old screenshot tank, for example. Lies the infamous Toto Stator Parlor, where a liquid net regiment jails are used to create stunning tattoos on bare bone. We wrap upon the magnificent bridge connecting the two harbor cliff tops under the Statue of Justice. Hides a morgue, a steep climb down to sea level reveals the beautiful, golden and blue Art Nouveau blue casket clubbed by Olivia Ofrenda. The very heart of Beatnik Rubakov, and the spot to discuss revolution, drink coffin shooters, and recite poetry in a building nurturing defiance, and standing out in an Art Deco modernist city of gleaming towers. It's not just architecture that alludes to 20th century modernism. As the city grew past its initial waterfront car, it was almost certainly influenced by functionalist ideals. Possibly even by the corpus years ready and the city plans, and adapted a predominantly great iron structure with regularly spaced diagonal avenues to its needs. Wide boulevards of a low and reasonably powerful demon-driven cars to achieve ludicrous speeds and connect pastoral suburbs with a bustling downtown that is developed both vertically and horizontally. Activities have been modestly organized, though, admittedly, the sheer fluidity of deaths reality had to lead to haphazard implementations, unfinished avenues, labyrinthine valleys, and clashing functions, adding to the confusion. Rubicon's recent civic explosion has been driven more by speculation and money laundering than planning for thought, allowing for odd configurations. And even no naturally big crocodiles in badly maintained sewers, with the exception of the few newer industrial areas, the latter in Finn Harbor and its surrounding leisure district remain the city's core economic hub. Gambling and entertainment are soaking up the cash produced by the hobby cities working on ships suspended in thin air. While gazing at the well-kept docks where opulent ocean liners await their lucky passengers, just as the harbor is divided between extravagant pleasures and hard toil, so is the rest of the city. Death was not the great leveler after all. Class lines are being drawn, and tensions rise as the rich keep on exploiting the poor. Even the pious seem capable of suffering in this cynical economy when. The chief of police is a notorious, bribable gambler, and upstanding crime laws like Hector Lemons can seemingly do as they please. The police are only interested in running protection schemes and arresting striking union members, inadvertently fueling the flames of the fledgling resistance. And as the cities, the workers, Vanguard, come closer to the incendiary ideas of the Beatniks. And the name of almost mythical revolutionary leader Salvador Lemons keeps on inspiring defiance. It is evident that a revolution is brewing. Just as the mob moves on to take over the town, everything developer David Orley, David Orley's everything, a follow-up to his 2014 game Mountain, is an unconventional open-world game that does not rely on quests. Are other familiar design shows to get players to navigate the world. Instead, it builds a game world that exists from the largest to smallest, most possible levels, and encourages players to become every object in those environments.
which range from planets to lions to buildings to cells to one-dimensional objects. It's not a game with a win state, per Southeast, and it does not encourage any competition or conflict. But as orally explained to us today, on the Gunnard Super Twitch channel, there was a lot of thought put into the game's seemingly undriven nature. Far one, orally says the game largely became possible after experimenting in different dimensions and realizing it was possible to bring any object into life. I got real excited about every object in the universe being a playable character. Orally told us that led to your thinking about groups of things and how everything is a member of a group, living or dead. Orally also felt like there was a link between this kind of experimentation and works created in the early days of animation, when 2D animators worked to bring all kind of objects to life, even ones that had no life at all. Far more insight from Orally on the development of everything.